Welcome everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer Casper, and um, I have the great honor of uh, welcoming you all to our first in a six part series of global health seminars um, that are being offered through our Harvard Medical School Office of Scholarly Engagement. Um, I have been the chair of the HMS OSC Faculty Advisory Committee of Global Health for upwards of about a decade now um, and have had a wonderful time mentoring many of you and, um, and getting to know in a very deep and personal and professional way the, the folks that you will hear from this evening. Um, tonight's topic is re-envisioning global health during and after the COVID pandemic. Um, and uh, please allow me to introduce uh, the speakers that will be with us this evening. Um, first, I'd like to introduce somebody who is not yet here, but will be here momentarily. His name is Dr. Jeff Katz. He is um, the director of the HMS Office of Scholarly Engagement. He's held that position since 2015. In addition, he's a clinical rheumatologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and the director of the Orthopedic and Arthritis Center for Outcomes Research. Um, he is also a professor of medicine and orthopedic surgery at HMS. Um, in alphabetical order, I also, again, have the great honor of introducing um, all of our panelists for today. Um, and I've chosen to do it in alphabetical order because I wouldn't know, you know who to put first, second, or third. I'd like to just introduce them all at once. Um, so the first person I'm, I'm happy and honored to introduce to you is Dr. Paul Farmer. Um, he is a medical anthropologist and a physician. He's dedicated his life to healthcare for the world's poorest people. He holds both an MD and PhD from Harvard University, where he is the Colocotronis University Professor and the Chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is also the co-founder and chief strategist of Partners in Health, an international nonprofit organization that since 1987 has provided direct healthcare services and undertaken research and advocacy on behalf of those who are sick and living in poverty. Dr. Farmer is the recipient of numerous honors and he's a member of the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences and the Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Luis Ivers is the executive director of the HMS Center for Global Health and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She is a practicing infectious disease physician at MGH, and she works on the design, implementation, and evaluation of large-scale public health programs in resource-limited settings with the goal of achieving health equity. She again has received numerous awards. She has served um, on, as an advisor to the WHO, as well as the Haitian Ministry of Health, and is a delegate to the Global Task Force for Cholera Control at the WHO as well. Dr. Michelle Morse is an internal medicine uh, physician and public health specialist who works uh, to achieve health equity through global solidarity, social medicine, and anti-racism education. She is the co-founder of Equal Health. Uh, she is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and she is also a co-founder of the Social Medicine Consortium. She too has received numerous awards, including the 40 Under 40 Leaders in Health Award. She has received an award from the Society of Hospital Medicine. And in 2019, she was the first black woman to receive the George W. Thorne Award, which was established in 1975 and is the highest clinical education award um, offered by the uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital Department of Medicine. Dr. Christian Olson is both a pediatrician and internist and serves as a member of the co core educator faculty and chief innovation officer in the Department of Medicine's residency program at Mass General Hospital. He is also the director of the MGH Springboard Studio and the Consortium for Affordable Medical Technologies, otherwise known as CAMTECH. He is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. He has worked extensively in low and middle income countries, 
as well as in the United States to develop medical solutions focused on value utilizing design thinking. Chris is known as a serial innovator. He has several patents, a licensed technology, and has started both nonprofit and for-profit ventures to accelerate ideas to implementation. And finally, again, last but not least, um, Dr. Claire Wagner. Um, I must say a recent graduate of HMS who received a dual degree in both the business school and the medical school and was the, uh, I don't know if I should call her the valedictorian, but the, the chosen speaker for the um, business school at graduation. But currently is now the chief of staff to the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute, a nonprofit biotechnology organization that applies translational science to combat diseases that disproportionately affect the poor. So what I'd like to do again, uh, we were chatting a little bit before this started and we were all saying, again, I, I am so honored to be in this position um, to know these individuals as both colleagues and friends. Um, and I'm so inspired by the work that they do. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd love each one of them to take a few moments just to you know, introduce themselves and their organizations. And then we'll begin um, what I hope is a very rich um, discussion about just what is going on with our COVID pandemic and with the multitude of other pandemics. Um, if I was to put on my other hat as a um, former president of Doctors for Global Health, um, an all volunteer international uh, non-governmental organization uh, dedicated to serving the rural poor. Um, one of the terms we use is liberation medicine, which for us is the conscious and conscientious use of health to promote human dignity and social justice. And I can think of no other individuals other than these folks before us um, who have absolutely practiced liberation medicine. And so without further ado, I would love Dr. Paul Farmer to um, share some comments. Thank you, Jen. Um, I just want to thank uh, the OSC for, for sponsoring this and allowing us all to participate. Um, you know, I assume that uh, the subtext of this is really about the social pathologies that we're um, variably familiar with. Some people very familiar because they've been forced to endure them and, uh, and live them, and others transiently aware. Next slide, and I'll just run through this in the interest of getting to discussion. Uh, in, we were invited to uh, discuss the work of quote unquote our organizations and I had the feeling that that was not meant to be HMS or the Brigham but rather the NGOs uh, with which a number of us are affiliated. I don't um, think of this as my organization of course. Uh, in fact every single one of the speakers and a number of the students here today have also worked um, with Partners in Health, which is, uh, which is uh, Jen has already introduced it, but I'd just like to say that the model um, there, which again is liable to, to change, there's not uh, one person or 10 people uh, setting the agenda, but uh, that if you look at um, these varied settings in which Partners in Health works, uh, it's really the work of 19,000 people. So obviously uh, these aren't 19,000 volunteers, they're employees and um, they are almost all, all and sometimes exclusively in some countries from the countries in which they were born or right around there. And that's especially true in the longer standing outposts uh, such as Haiti, uh, Rwanda uh, and Russia um, and you know I'll, I'll have a chance to talk more about this but from the very beginning of the COVID pandemic um, each of these settings has been um, each of these teams which vary in size from some hundreds of people to some thousands has been engaged in responding to COVID in some places like Peru um, you know it's been a very big burden of disease uh, in Mexico, um, 
in some places, Rwanda, Malawi, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, Lesotho, it has been significantly less. And in uh, some places, for example, I was just on uh, phone calls with our colleagues in from Rwanda, Malawi, uh, and Haiti. And Rwanda, they, they really haven't had many uh, positive cases at all in a couple of weeks in our, within our teams or in our clinical settings where we're working, uh, which is very good news. We're, of course, in Boston. Next slide. In Boston, um, we've been uh, working together with the, again, the public authorities, public health authorities, in this case, the state of Massachusetts and 350 local health departments um, to stand up a uh, contact tracing initiative, probably one of the first ones in this country. Um, and a number of uh, students and faculty and others involved with Harvard Medical School have been involved in this. Next slide. I just wanted to draw our attention uh, to uh, three points. One is the one I made already. I think the subtext of this discussion for many of the students is how do we understand not just the pathogens, but the pathogenic social forces underpinning um, the contours of a pandemic like this. And these are, again, not race and class and gender, but racism, classism, and gender inequality. And I'm sure we'll explore that uh, since the goal here is to think about how COVID uh, might allow us to break open um, some of the constraints that we have faced in uh, developing equitable healthcare systems. Second, next slide, please. And I just want to draw your attention to something we've seen it again and again over the years when you span worlds as disparate of, as, let's say, rural Malawi and uh, Boston's Longwood Medical Area. And one of the things we've seen again and again, unfortunately, often from our colleagues in public health and from uh, development economics has been clinical nihilism. That is, you know, it's just not cost effective, sustainable, uh, go right through the list, um, feasible even or, or prudent uh, to focus on the quality of clinical care in settings that might well be termed clinical deserts. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about Ebola and would be glad to, but we've seen this with every difficult pathology and you know, cancers in, across the world. Um, and again, it, it strikes a lot of our American colleagues, my colleagues at the Brigham, for example, as, uh, as bizarre. You, you know, the idea that there would be uh, forces and people and experts counseling not to bother with treatment. Next slide and last slide. Um, but what we're seeing right now in the United States is a, a species of containment nihilism. That is, it is being argued, not that the cl clinical care doesn't matter. And that was why there was so much fuss about ventilators, antivirals, therapeutics of all sorts, but really uh, people giving up too soon uh, on uh, the idea of containment. That is linking the clinical care um, to preventive e efforts that are uh, as aggressive as some, some as we've seen in Rwanda and even Malawi, Lesotho, Sierra Leone, and Liberia have uh, probably, in many instances, done a better job. So we've called this reverse innovation, meaning we've caught, you know, we've stolen that term because it seems to please some people. But in fact, there is a tradition, uh, very underdeveloped, alas, of community health workers in this country as well. And I'm sure uh, we'll hear more about that. Um, I, I know that that's an, that should be enough to kick off conversation. And again, thank you for letting me um, uh, address some of these concerns and uh, I'll pass it back to Jen or Jeff. Thank you, Paul. Um, and I think it'd be wonderful to now hear from Dr. Luis Ivers, please. Great. I'm hoping you can see my slides. Yes, Get a thumbs up. we can. So I, I thank you so much for the very kind introduction. I was going to say that the introductions were too kind, but then I realized maybe my colleagues wouldn't <laughs> appreciate that. It's really great to be here. So thank you, Dr. Casper, for inviting me. I, want, I wanted to, in my opening comments, make three points if I could. First is actually a little bit of an advertisement, if I can, about Mass General Hospital's global health work and the Center for Global Health. I've had the privilege of 
being part of the Harvard community now for um, 20 years almost, for um, being mentored by Dr. Farmer, for working with Partners in Health. And my role at the moment is, um, and my administrative role is to be the director of the Center for Global Health. And I think when I first took that role, I really wasn't aware of really the scope and breadth and depth of Mass General Hospital's global health work. And as a bit of a pseudopod from the Partners in Health um, ecosystem, I, I think it's worthwhile just spending a moment letting the students know a little bit about our work. Uh, we, we, we work as an academic medical center really trying to leverage the pieces that academic medical centers um, have in terms of pillars of taking care of patients, research and innovation, and medical education. And we actually have programs in each of the five areas that are highlighted on this um, icon, which we recently developed as part of our strategy work. And I could spend time going into each of them, which I won't, but I just wanted to share that we have a couple of unique features at MGH in our global health work that many folks are not aware of. One is that we have a very nice global nursing program, which really is focused on trying to develop um, nursing um, skills and capacity and empowering our nursing colleagues in global settings, which is often very much an underappreciated voice and profession uh, overseas in, our, in low resourced countries. And we also have a kind of unique program at Mass General in terms of being able to respond to sudden onset disasters. So we have a very small team that is allowed and facilitated to deploy during mass events or humanitarian crises in a way that is not the same as say a Partners in Health, which has a long-term um, engagement with community, but where we really seek out partnerships um, in which we can have our small teams deploy and, um, and work more. Chris Olson is going to speak a little bit later, and he um, is certainly part of our innovation work. So I won't focus on each of these, but I would like to draw attention um, to them. And then also in my last slide, invite everyone, and I can drop this in the chat, to take a look at your, uh, at your leisure <laughs> at our website, which does dive into explaining a little bit more about the work at Mass General, opportunities to get engaged, mentors where you could seek um, mentorship as a student. What I also wanted to say though, my, which is my second point, is that when I think about re-envisioning global health at the time of COVID or in a pandemic, to be perfectly honest with you, I really don't see re-envisioning it. But what I do see is that it's really a moment in which both the pandemic and this massive social movement finally, or eventually in the United States and around the world for black lives, really needs to be a reckoning to those of us who are engaged in global health if we haven't had this reckoning before, to really realize that global health is not supposed to be something and is not really something at its ethos that should be done to other people. It is not about us doing things to other people, but unfortunately for way too long, global health has been constructed that way. And I don't mean by those of us on this line, but I mean in terms of universities and public health and academic medical centers. And I think we have to really recognize in that way that we actually don't own global health. So we as Harvard can't really be re-envisioning it because it is not really for us to own and name and re-envision. We have a number of challenges at, at Harvard that I do think we um, can re-envision in our global health work. And that includes not very bit challenging times to get some of our global experts to become faculty at Harvard Medical School. It's very challenging to have a mentor in Rwanda or Haiti or Malawi or Yemen <laughs> to be named appropriately and equitably as a Harvard faculty member and to be therefore kind of acknowledged for the work that they contribute to our scholarship. So I think, you know, how we engage in global health as a university and a medical school, I hope in the time of COVID, will drawing on the lessons from Partners in Health and from many things that Paul has written and others have written and really integrating into the social movement to change how we center ourselves, especially as a large um, number of white faculty, frankly, at Harvard Medical School, to really think about decentering ourselves in the quest for health equity and like, finding ways and finding pathways to really acknowledge that talent is very much equally distributed around the world, but the resources are not. And that what I think our role is in global health, 
especially in elite institutions, is to really find the opportunities to shift the resources and make pathways for the resources to be shifted. So I'd say the challenge is that perhaps in the pandemic, we have an opportunity as advocates of this way forward to really um, use the momentum for change to try to help get that kind of change out there and to try to um, enact that change. And I think if we were able to do that, we'd really be making tremendous progress. I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ivers. Um, and now, uh, Dr. Michelle Morse, if you would please take the stage front and center and share your thoughts. Sounds great. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Okay. We see your screen as well. It's always a little bit of a miracle when it works, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll be brief and, and so, um, of course, honored to, to follow uh, Doctors Farmer and Ivers and Casper, who have all been mentors to me at various parts of my path in this work. And, and I'll be, uh, again, as brief as I can, even though my slides <laughs> might not suggest it. Um, but I, but I'm, I'm, you know, really excited for the dialogue about this, kind of what what does it mean to re-envision global health and what role should we have in it, if any? Um, and I want to just start with, with home for me, which is West Philadelphia. And one of the first flyers that I saw when I moved back home to Philly was uh, a, a self-determination and West Philly autonomy, um, community-based kind of uh, community-led organizing effort to really tried to stop University of Penn, which is where I was coming home to go to medical school in West Philly, from gentrifying the West Philly community. That was in 2003. Um, for any of you who've been to West Philly now in 2020, uh, you can guess who won that battle, uh, just based on what you see walking through the streets. But the reason I start here is because I do think it's so important to understand what's happening at home. Um, and that is the framework that allows you to understand how global uh, uh, oppression happens, how uh, structural violence plays out all around the world, how neoliberalism and structural racism and, and colonialism impact communities all over the world. Um, it's by understanding what oppression and the result in health inequities in, in your context look like. And, and coming home to Philly in 2003 to see this uh, was exactly uh, what I needed to be focusing on. Um, but not long after that, I went to Botswana and spent a year out, um, uh, what's called a year out. I don't know if you guys even call it that anymore, but that's what we called it back when I was a medical student, which feels like forever ago now. So I lived in Botswana from 2003 to 2000. Uh, excuse me, 2006 to 2008, um, during the early years of the Botswana government um, rolling out the first free HIV AIDS treatment program on the continent. Um, and at that time, predictions were that um, the community, the, the, the citizenship of Botswana were going to be extinct within a couple generations because of how high the rates of TB and HIV were. Um, and the life expectancy for uh, people in Botswana at the year, the year that I was there was 36 years. Um, and this uh, x-ray is one of the most unforgettable ones I've ever seen. I never uh, uh, imagined um, the ways that oppression um, and to Dr. Farmer's point, nihilism were playing out in the, the lives and communities and day-to-day -day experiences and, and the bodies of, of people in Botswana at the time. And it, it got me engaged, of course, in the AIDS movement back home in Philly. So of course I joined ACT UP Philly uh, when I got back from Botswana and uh, really learned about how social movements or started to learn about how social movements can transform the social and structural oppression that we unfortunately uh, all probably know too well at this point. Um, but I, I show this picture because it, it brings back a lot of nostalgia for my, my journey in understanding this, this work and this world of, of global health equity um, and helps me also to think about, well, where, where do we need to go? Um, or where, where uh, from my perspective, do, do I think we need to go? This is, uh, this is Haiti in August of 2009. Uh, in Kanj, my first trip to Haiti. 
And, and long, not long after that, uh, many of you will remember the earthquake in Haiti in January of 2010. It's, this is the 10 year anniversary of that earthquake, um, but it was a pivotal point um, in my journey in trying to understand both how oppression happens and how to interrupt it um, and upend it. And it led me, of course, in this journey of, of co-founding an organization called Equal Health that used to be called Physicians for Haiti. It was a very nonlinear path uh, in the work that we've done over the past decade, but one of the most important fruits of that work. And what for me helps me to think about what the future of global health and global health engagement and global solidarity could look like is the, the Haitian student-led organization that uh, was spawned from uh, us now doing, I think this is our seventh or eighth year of doing social medicine immersion courses in rural Haiti. Um, and Social Medicine Alumni Haiti is, is going strong. And I'll, I'll share a link towards the end, uh, but they're going to be one of the leading organizations presenting for our global summit this weekend. Um, we, we are very, very excited to use that summit, uh, which should have been in Imbarara, Uganda in person, um, but will be held virtually instead to keep exploring the, the topics that we're talking about just this evening uh, with all of you. Um, but what got those students fired up was uh, their recognition of how they had been miseducated about what actually causes illness, right? And, and these four circles, I think, helped them to see that. Uh, and I would also say that, you know, the use of tools like the approach to education that Polo Freire and others um, have pushed for uh, in, uh, and that we applied in our social medicine courses is why that course became a platform for, um, you know, deep change for uh, mobilization of students and community members alike and uh, became a platform for movement building. Um, and so when, when we saw, uh, you know, graphs like this one, uh, students who graduated from our courses wouldn't say, great, we're doing awesome. <laughs> um, they would say, what, what, are, what is the world doing to oppress Africa? Why, <laughs> why is it in, in 2030, this whole entire graph is, is this teal color, which represents Sub-Saharan Africa? So um, that analysis, I think, has really helped, again, to build um, uh, 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 an analysis that has really caught fire amongst a lot of health workers. And the way that we teach global health and social medicine is by talking about what are sometimes taboo topics like the white savior industrial complex and what that represents and what that means and how, again, we try uh, or could try to more effectively interrupt it. And uh, helps us to recognize when the media and uh, other, you know, folks, organizations and, and uh, uh, groups, uh, you know, misunderstand or sanitize what's really happening, right? And the New York Times uh, is certainly guilty of that. So on the left, you see the New York Times framing of the Tuskegee syphilis study. On the right, you see the Black Panthers framing of it, right? Two pretty different uh, uh, results would come from seeing the issues framed in that way. And that's part of what we are trying to do in the work that we the work that we do from social medicine to global health equity and beyond. Um, and just in these last couple of slides, I'll wrap up by saying that part of what we've also done is instead of only being health workers, we've really integrated activists and organizers as much as possible, the ones who are willing to deal with us. <laughs> Many of them are not, <laughs> um, but the ones that are willing to deal with us uh, have, have become involved in uh, what is our uh, global campaign against racism through the Social Medicine Consortium and Equal Health? And we launched it uh, about two years ago. We're now in our third year. But you can see on the left, like these are the terms that folks use to describe white supremacy in their context and in their language. And that was a big part of how we launched the campaign in a way that was intersectional and relevant globally, um, not just an American definition of racism, but a definition that brought together experiences of oppression and the result in health inequities all around the world, um, such that now we have 24 chapters across 11 countries in our third year. Uh, and we talk about things like land rights and land redistribution as one of the critical tools for achieving health equity. Um, we talk about how elimination of the race modifier in EGFR could get us there as well. And our Vanderbilt chapter, Nashville chapter, worked for two years to get EGFR uh, uh, race, the rest, race corrected version eliminated uh, from their lab reporting and their health system. 
Um, and we talk about reparations uh, and, and, and how important reparations could be um, as a policy solution for racial health inequities in the US and, and all over the world. So um, I, hopefully that's enough to chew on and get some dialogue going about um, uh, what global health is <laughs> and where it goes and how it uh, is shaped by so many of us, um, but owned by none of us to Dr. Ivers's point. Um, thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Morse. Um, and I'd love to hand this uh, Zoom microphone over to Dr. Olson, please. Can you see that? Um, sure. thank so uh, one, thank you, uh, Dr. Morse and, and Dr. Farmer and Dr. Ivers. It, it's, um, and and Dr. Casper for just um, inviting me to be a part of this panel. And I'll have to say I would just be sitting and listening to this because it's it, it's really fantastic. Um, I just wanted to talk. So as you heard from uh, uh, Louise, I work with Louise at at the Mass General Center for Global Health, and I'm the director of of uh, CAMTECH or the Consortium for Affordable Medical Technology. And then really contrary to a lot of what um, uh, we think about as a, as a flow of models flowing back and forth, um, I'm also the director of the Springboard Studio at Mass General that really arose from learnings uh, that we uh, garnered from working in Sub-Saharan Africa and in principally in Uganda as well as in India. Um, I'm going to see if I can, um, so, uh, our tenet is, is really, um, that healthcare needs more design thinking to, to solve a number of the, the inequities, the frustrations, the redundancies that we see in healthcare. And, and, and the idea is that, that really uh, a lot of people think of design thinking, which is not a term I even knew when I was first working in, in direct patient care and, and education in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and in the Horn of Africa. But, but really it's, it's about empathetic listening and, and, um, and understanding uh, intimately what are the challenges being addressed. And to put it in sort of uh, entrepreneurial terms, um, if you think about healthcare ventures that start, um, two thirds of, of new ventures in healthcare fail because they're solving problems that nobody has. And, and it was one thing that, that was really honed into me uh, early on is just how um, incredibly creative and, um, and um, how nuanced the adaptations people have made in the setting of limited resources are to their to their environment and how much they've been able to do uh, with what they had. And so we don't think of, of design thinking as just something that's aspirational or nice to have. We think of it as this, this blended mix of, of what's feasible, what's viable, and what's desirable, and then trying to, to get to a solution that, that's workable. And, um, and I'll just bring up to put some, some color on it, that um, I've been in touch with a, a, a number of these people uh, this week but, uh, and, and last week. But um, just to give you some pictures, so um, Dr. Morris, you, you were talking about Embraera, and so the bottom left picture is in Embraera and is a, is a, a collective problem solving uh, event. And, and it was really uh, impressed uh, upon me as, as this, we sort of just um, brought in this platform, suggested um, uh, that, um, that uh, people should really be addressing what challenges they have. And, and what, what we often found was this sort of surprised look like, oh, you're really asking. And, and going in with, with this notion that I don't know intimately what even challenge you have, uh, let alone the solutions. And, and then just to highlight, maybe we can get into some of these as we discuss, but, but um, uh, so Embraer University sort of said before there was this platform and this unleashing of, of uh, creativity, 
Um, they said there really wasn't technology at the Embraer University of Science and Technology. And, and but when their members started banding together and we're really talking about cross-disciplinary engagement so that it's not an internist talking to a neurologist, um, it's really this recognition that you bring a patient uh, or patients in the room with, with healthcare providers, uh, doctors, nurses, midwives, as well as engineers, designers, and, um, and even uh, business people to kind of think about how you bring some ideas forward. I'll just mention this, the group at the top that started out of this platform called the Collard Group um, had uh, pre-pandemic uh, the capacity to produce 80 liters a day of a hand sanitizer. And it was the only medical grade hand sanitizer in, in um, East Africa that had gone through a, a, a really rigid process of, of, um, of uh, uh, through the Bureau of Standards. And so they had it there, but, but um, um, we're producing about the 80 liters a week. And then just to highlight that, that when the pandemic arose, they had a lot more stipulations and with the lockdown put on them and they rented this house that you see in that picture, were staying there overnight and, and expanded their capacity to produce 2000 liters a day of, of a locally made hand sanitizer. And I'll just say Lattice Innovations, a medical device, device firm that uh, formed as a result of one of these um, uh, engagements in in Delhi we work with them a lot they give us a lot of advice and work and then Koyo labs down in the left had produced um, a infant CPAP called sans that they adapted during the pandemic to be an adult um, uh, high flow nasal cannula as well as um, uh, uh, adult uh, CPAP device that's treated over 2,000 patients and and this was really in incredible to me. And so just to see the unleashing of, of people when they're really um, uh, addressing the challenges that they're facing in their own communities and how motivated they are from it. And, and I'll just mention that, that really in this notion and spirit that, that uh, how much we've taken here. So um, we started the Springboard Studio in 2018 at MGH taking these lessons of of really honing in on what the challenge is and trying to get to what a minimally viable product would be in terms of solving the cha challenge at hand and, and really um, working with the um, Center for COVID Innovation. Um, we have um, five things that, that have been um, inpatient use since, since they were conceived in, in March. And, and, um, and one of those things was, uh, again, a lesson that we, took from, from uh, Korea and dealing with a the hospital there, the, the um, testing booths that are really the mainstay of testing at Mass General. And I, and I think just approaching global health as truly global and, and, um, and really with humility going in and, and looking that um, need is the mother of in, invention. We've seen it over and over again and, and just how um, uh, our colleagues are, are teaching us and how we bring in our learnings and together um, we can solve contextual uh, problems. And so uh, with that, I'll leave it and hopefully it'll spark uh, some discussion as well, so. Thank you, Dr. Olson. If folks wanna take some time and start populating the chat box, um, uh, we have both uh, Rachel Wittenberg and Brendan Epen as the co-leaders uh, of the HMS Student uh, Global Health Interest Group um, to uh, both collate those and so forth. But um, maybe also some things to uh, consider and chew on. I'm just, I'm so struck by, um, you know, again, I, I'm not at all disappointed by the, the quality and the depth of the conversation, like right out of the gates were, we're, we're talking about social pathogens, right? That, um, you know, as Paul already said, and, you know, are we being nihilistic in our, in our thoughts? And, and it kind of ties me to some of the comments that, that, that Dr. Olson made here in terms of like, um, yes, we need to recognize the, the problems that exist, but 
how do we garner or activate the local expertise and creativity? Um, I'm, I'm so reminded of when I worked in rural El Salvador with um, campesinos who had, you know, during a 12 year civil conflict, everything shut down, including the education system. And so the, the folks with whom I worked had third, sixth grade high school educations. And yet I knew for a fact, if they were given opportunities to study here in the States or anywhere else, that they would have been the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists, the government leaders, and so forth. And, and I was just reminded that, you know, numerous times they would say, you know, we are Salvadorans and, and we need and want to solve our Salvadoran problems. So, um, you know, I appreciate this, this naming, uh, you know, Dr. Morris of racism, sex, sexism, neocolonialism, oppression, um, and what pedagogical strategies are we using? And, and, and kind of this, not that we own this and we do things to people, um, but as Dr. Ivers said, like we're hopefully doing a great deal of listening and sort of the best, uh, as I understand Buddhism, to really, really listen um, and um, allow those voices of the individuals most affected um, by a lot of these structural issues to have a voice at the table and name what and how they want to um, tackle some problems. Um, it looks like I am, uh, I'm got, I've got a couple of chats here. Um, so just I'll let people sort of sit with that for just a moment. Um, Dr. Katz, uh, Katz just said in the interest of time, uh, he's happy to say hello on the chat. Um, again, he directs the Office of Scholar Engagement and he's, again, what a wonderful program. Uh, thanks to Jen and the organizers and thanks so much to this marvelous panel of speakers. Um, and maybe we'll just go ahead, um, let us know again, Catherine, if... Uh, Jen, I'm here. If you... Wonderful. Dr. Wagner, please, please okay. take front and center stage again. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Okay. I'm sorry for the technological difficulties. We use uh, Teams at the, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute. So I, Zoom is uh, <laughs> not on my regular day-to-day -day activities. Um, anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Casper, Dr. Katz, uh, Karen, and Catherine. It's really, really wonderful to be with you all this evening um, and to be up here with many of my mentors. Uh, and, and have this opportunity to have a discussion together. Um, as Paul mentioned, many of us have been in the Partners in Health orbit for a while now. Um, and I just wanted to mention that uh, a decade ago, I had the opportunity to, to move to Rwanda to work with Paul and with Dr. Ines Kuniguaho, um, then the Minister of Health, and spending three years there uh, trying to keep up with the history that they were making was just incredible. Um, and, and then having the opportunity to switch hats and work with the Dana Farber Cancer Institute on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines um, really brought, brought um, a new uh, element to global health for my own education. Um, and then I have this incredible opportunity to study at HMS and, and also HBS um, and apply some of those learnings in an academic setting. And so being up here with you all uh, virtually is, is really special to me. So thank you so much. Um, so I'll give just a very brief introduction of um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute. So we are a nonprofit biotechnology organization. We are fully financed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as one of its subsidiaries. And what does that mean? It means that we function as an independent organization, um, but we have full financing secured from the foundation, which enables us to go where a lot of for-profit biopharma companies don't go or can't go. Um, so that's a really exciting place to be. And as you all know, here at HMS, uh, there's a really big divide between our scientific discoveries and how we apply those to product development for pharmaceutical products. Um, so and today, you know, the scientific community has these unprecedented tools at, this, at its disposal um, and these advances in how we actually develop drugs and vaccines um, are happening faster than we've ever um, had the opportunity to develop them in the past. And so the MRI asks the question, why can't we apply these advances to diseases that affect uh, the world's poor? So that is what our organization um, has set out to do. It was founded two and a half years ago 
uh, and our mission is to develop products to fight malaria, TB, uh, diarrheal diseases, and improve outcomes in maternal and newborn uh, health, which are major causes of mortality and major drivers and results of poverty in under-resourced settings, as you've heard in many different ways from um, my fellow panelists here. Um, and like all biotechs or many biotechs these days, uh, we have also pivoted quickly and added COVID to our portfolio. Um, and I can get into a little bit of that later. Um, for many of you, this is something you already know. For some of you, maybe it's new, but uh, just as a quick backdrop the, the, on, the, on what um, product development looks like in biopharma. So the road to product development is certainly non-linear, uh, it's full of obstacles and paved usually with profit-based incentives. Um, in fact, many people call the space of translational medicine the valley of death because so many products go there to die. So for product to get to the end of the road, the pharmaceutical owner needs to see the benefit outweighing the risk. And that means that there has to be some kind of profit margin on the other side. But when you're talking about diseases that affect patients in low and middle income countries, that margin gets thinner and thinner and thinner. So the incentive to keep pushing product down the path becomes less and less and less. And so that's where we come in. We are bringing together tip of the spear science with talent largely from industry and this nonprofit financing model to address some of these uh, product, product development pitfalls that have traditionally hindered our ability to tackle some of the diseases that kill tens of millions of people a year, as, as you all know. So just quickly at a glance, um, we lead targets through, uh, we identify lead targets through clinical trials, and then we work on translating those into, into products that can actually have an impact. Um, we are, our headquarters are based here in Kendall Square, or in this lovely room that I'm in, uh, as we're all working from home these days. Um, and we are 85 people to date, uh, and we work on a number of different disease areas now, um, and, uh, and we're growing uh, pretty quickly. So that's really exciting. Um, our portfolio is super dynamic, and this is just to give you kind of a snapshot of where we see ourselves going in the next four years. This is our, um, this is our plan. So, uh, and we've, as I mentioned, we've grown tremendously over the past two and a half years. We're now a fully bimodal organization, which means we, um, we go from translational medicine all the way to late stage development. We have four clinical trials currently ongoing, and we expect to have more than 20 by 2024, with over half of those being in phase two or three. Um, so specific to COVID, we are focusing on therapeutics for patients with mild disease to prevent progression to severe disease. Um, so for, uh, for example, to prevent hospitalization or intensive care. Um, and we think this is important in general, but also um, because we just should have therapeutic interventions available to prevent uh, progression of disease. But in particular, we at the MRI have focused on this area because the world's ICU supply is limited. And we think this is a really important area of investigation. Um, and not a lot of companies are working on this because of that, uh, well, partly because of that slide that I showed you with the path for product development. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you might have heard about remdesivir in the news or other, other drugs that are in that pre-post-exposure prophylaxis um, space. So we are hoping that our, um, our clinical target, which is, um, which is actually uh, Xarelto, will hold promise for patients uh, to prevent uh, progression to severe disease. And this is all on clinicaltrials.gov. You can read about it. Um, and we are, we are currently enrolling patients in that trial actively um, and recruiting patients to that trial with a target of 600 patients. Um, so we're, we're hopeful and we, are, um, we, are, we feel fortunate and privileged to be in uh, a financial position to take that risk because a lot of companies aren't able to do that. 
Um, and with that, I will uh, pause and I'm happy to go into, into more detail about, um, about that as well. And I hope that is helpful to start the discussion. So thank you so much, Dr. Casper. I will turn it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you again, Dr. Wagner, for being so patient uh, and waiting your turn. And, you know, because you all just did not shy away from all of these challenging topics, which I, I knew you wouldn't. Um, you all have been, you know, truly walking the walk and talking the talk. And so, you know, as I was kind of reflecting on this event and, and thinking about um, and reading, um, you know, I'm just so, you know, distressingly reminded, you know, what a as uh, Alicia Yamin put recently, like a scandalously inequitable world we live in. Um, you know, statistics like 1% of the wealthiest, um, you know, who live in, in this world, you know, is the equivalent of the remainder of our global population. And, um, you know, and I just uh, recently named a kind of a laundry list of terms that you all have shared. And, and so, why don't we just jump to one of a question that I have, and then we'll we'll take some questions from the audience. And um, you know, I, I want to see the global pandemic as as again as this opportunity to dismantle and really transform um, entrenched inequitable structures. Um, and so, I'm curious, you know, it, what you all have to say about you know, what have you witnessed in your work with um, the communities and collaborator, collaborators in country? Um, what health or social innovations um, are you witnessing that you see as most promising and ones that we could really elevate? Um, or how might we think about, you know, investments in clinical care research and advocacy and how to integrate or prioritize those? Um, and so again, is this our opportunity to use some of the Doctors for Global Health terms to consciously and conscientiously transform practices of medicine and public health um, so that we're creating actually a really new paradigm anchored in health equity? So I, there was a whole bunch of questions. Um, and again, we're going to have to just, anyone who feels moved, um, please uh, offer your thoughts. Thank you. I feel moved. I'm happy to... <laughs> I feel very wonderful. Moved. Thank you, Dr. Ivers. You know, I think I, 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 and actually one of the reasons why I really love working with the students, and so I wish like we could be in the room with them and see their voices, is that I feel the enthusiasm of like youth and dynamism about what change is possible. And I honestly really feed off that a lot myself as I become an older, older and older in this world, because I feel quite... I feel much more pessimistic about what the world will do because I think pandemics before have never really catalyzed the kind of transform transformative change that I think we all seek. Like if you listen to each of the conversations that the panelists have had, I think there's a total consensus here about where innovation actually comes from, um, what the challenges are, which are the resources, whether it's to get to medical school, whether it's to build the thing, whether it's to get the microphone to share the information. So I feel like that we, you know, in March we had a whole panel discussion about, you know, seeking health equity in the time of COVID. And we really talked about all the things we knew would happen in the US, whether it was in prison populations or Native American populations. You know, we we predicted the inequities that we knew would be amplified. And yet, even with that warning, I didn't see a whole lot of momentum to enact the, you know, to make the investments to enact on the change that would redress that imbalance. So I would I I think it's on all of us to actually, because I don't think there's too much disagreement, say, with even this group's. To, at all on how things have to change, what our vision, our shared vision of global health actually is. When I say I don't think we need to re-envision it, it's because I think many of us have the same vision that we've always had about what global health actually is. And what we have to do is to, to realize that vision and somehow bring structures and systems with us to ensure that that changes. 
And, and I don't know exactly how to do that. I'd love to hear from other panelists also on their, their reflections about that. But I would like to see a transformative change, but I fear in my experiences so far, that hasn't really happened. But maybe I'm too much of a pessimist. Um, I'll just jump in and add, add one more quick comment to what uh, what Dr. Ivers just mentioned, I think, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I think she's spot on, right? I think um, the, the community of people who are engaged in kind of glo a global solidarity approach to global health equity, um, it's, it's a diverse group. There's certainly a diverse set of opinions and approaches. Um, and at the same time, I think the tragedy um, but the, what the New England Journal editor said, the crisis that became a tragedy, right? So the tragedy of COVID um, globally um, isn't, isn't what we predicted in so many ways, so much so that many of the chapters in our campaign are saying, well, the vaccine's just not the most important issue for us right now. And, you know, we appreciate that y'all are concerned about it. And, and we're certainly not surprised that the Global North is buying up all the doses. But, um, you know, we have, we have really, we have other priorities. And that's not to say it shouldn't be a priority, but it is to say, again, a, a American-centric view of global health would force a vaccine prioritization framework above many other things. And, and that's maybe not the only conversation to be had, I guess. But, but I also just, the, the thing I wanted to mention more specifically is, I think what we're also seeing is that as health workers in particular and physicians especially, um, it should be much easier for us to make those intersectional um, links and, and make it much easier for us to say, well, of course, if you want to do global health equity work, you should be on board with reparations. And of course, if you see global health equity as your practice of global solidarity, then you should be thinking about why you're not on board with abolition and, and the ending the prison industrial complex, particularly considering all the data that we know about COVID in prisons uh, and among other diseases, TB for those of you who've been working on TB for forever, et cetera, pick your poison. But um, I hope that this moment will make it much clearer what the policy, the policies and the platforms and the position should be for people who are engaging in global solidarity and global health work. Um, and I think that they should be, uh, they should be much more radical than they've been. Thank you, Dr. Morse. Other thoughts from anybody, please. One thing I'll just uh, mention, I, I agree with um, uh, both Dr. Ivers and Dr. Morse's comments. And one, one thing that we should just be calling out is just what a, what a tragedy and, and failing uh, our own response has been. And I, and I again think um, uh, we really um, need to approach health at a population and community level with a greater sense of, of humility. Um, people with much fewer resources and utilizing much fewer resources are, are responding so much more effectively. And it's really still hurt um, uh, uh, people at the lowest um, income levels in, in those countries, undoubtedly. And, and we had a discussion just a couple days ago with my um, colleagues in Delhi about how their lockdown really hurt their migrant population, but how communities really have have stepped up to deliver um, food stuffs, how there's been innovation in education technology that is getting to the lowest echelons uh, economically of of their communities and and I just have to you know let 's call out that the u s um, in many respects has weaponized um, uh, our response to COVID into a political battle that, that um, should not be. And, and also just as, as um, our, our approach to individualistic uh, notions of determination are not um, maybe the healthiest for a population and, and the community and maybe um, ultimately for ourselves. And I, I think we can learn a lot from, from what our colleagues have, one, endured and have achieved 
in the face of even this pandemic, um, which is one of many that, that so many of these places have gone through. Thank you, Chris. And, and Dr. Farmer, did you have a... No, I mean, I, I would love to just, again, give a warning, having uh, just been very inspired by the comments so far, by the, you know, the lucid summaries off offered. I want to go back to warning um, progressive, thoughtful students and colleagues uh, against uh, an enthusiasm to understand or to respond to social determinants by forgetting the fact that you know there is a problem of clinical nihilism as well. And again, as Claire said, you know when you don't when you start um, drilling down on let's say cancer in you know a place like Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, you know parts of the United States where there are uh, incredibly burdensome disparities of both risk and access to early diagnosis and care. Mm -hmm. So it's not optional, uh, especially if you're involved in nursing, medicine, any kind of direct services, to be worried about clinical nihilism as well. Um, I mentioned containment nihilism because we're at, in the grips of that in the United States. But if we had done, as I, I've already heard many times this past couple of months, well, you know, we, we, we shouldn't have been focusing over much on the clinical interventions like you know mechanical ventilation well if we were focusing on clinical interventions and why is our case fatality 10 percent in a place like new york and it's under two percent in south korea and taiwan and you know go shopping around so on neither clinical intervention nor containment have we done a good job and that that's you know how you go from uh, you know, to, into a full-blown tragedy. Um, you know, the, the only thing that I can think of that does give me uh, hope, I mean, I'm saying, not that I'm not a hopeful person, but if it is true, as many have hypothesized, that being stuck at home, social isolating, led to, in any way, the vigorous response to George Floyd's murder, then I think there's, there's the silver lining, is the, the chance that we can organize for progressive uh, social change in the midst of, you know, in part because of some newfound awareness of an old and long, you know, of a longstanding and structural problem. But I'm very concerned about the idea of, oh no, we've been paying too much attention to clinical care and we've ignored, you know, containment. Doesn't that sound just like in, a, you know, in the AIDS discussions in the, in the 90s, oh, we paid so much attention to clinical care before a single patient was on publicly funded therapy. You know, we paid too much attention to uh, clinical care. We haven't focused on prevention. So these traps, which we don't get ensnared in as victims, we get ensnared in as perpetrators or you know, enablers or something like that, where we start picking up this language of, well, we focus too much on this and forgot about that. If you are at risk, high risk of COVID because you're an essential worker, then you're at risk of both infection and poor outcomes once infected. And, you know, that I would argue, we must be literate in understanding how to discuss this. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for that acknowledgement of the, dub the double jeopardy, if you will, of both being highly at risk for acquiring and then having the worst outcomes. Um, thank you all. Let me let me pivot to um, a question and um, from our from our uh, folks here in the audience. And one of the questions here is, um, and I quote, one of the poverty traps from Collier's bottom billion is bad governance or corruption. Related to the COVID-19 containment, have we learned from others around the world that disease containment works better with a decentralized or a more centralized approach? Or are we wrong to cast responsibility on local governance um, in place of social forces from international agents? Um, so thoughts on that particular question, please.
who wants to go? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's interesting, right? I mean, I feel like there's, you know, in some form it's, you know, is it vertical? Is it horizontal? Is it somewhere in the middle? I mean, you know. I, I can also, I mean, what I think I've learned, what I've certainly learned about pretty much every problem in community health or global health is that, and Chris um, said something exactly like this in his design thinking for solutions is that, you know, the, the people who are the closest to the problem are the people who have the solutions to the problem and actually they understand the problem. And, you know, so I think in terms of thinking about centralized versus decentralized, I don't really think of it as a totally binary approach, but I do think that, you know, you can certainly have a, I would have loved to see a federal strategy in the United States. I would still like to see one <laughs> on a number of areas, but I also think that whether you're doing contact tracing or whether you're doing vaccine delivery, that when you want to get to communities, when you want to understand um, the enablers of access to care, when you want to um, have health workers that understand what the true risk factors are, when you want to track down a cluster, having people who are in the community, from the community, part of the community is the most effective way to actually reach the community and really truly understand the problems. So I would say um, that I think that doesn't mean there shouldn't be some central perspective strategy, but it, and it has to be informed by that. I, I think particularly in this pandemic, a totally decentralized approach would I don't think would be as successful either. But I definitely think it's it's we have a tendency also to over centralize solutions and then not be able to understand delivery. And maybe this is what Dr. Wagner is also talking about, things that just don't get to translation, they don't get to be used because people are like, well, why didn't why couldn't we actually get that vaccine there? And they haven't really tried to decentralize their approach to it. Hey, Sandra, I, I would, um, I want to tie what you said to something that you taught me, Paul, uh, and that, or you and Dr. Agnes taught me some years ago, and then many, many, many more times since then. Uh, but always, you, you taught me to always ask the question, who are you accountable to? And I think that gets at some of what you were saying, Dr. Ivers, sort of how do we how do we think about our own foundation of accountability? Um, and how often do we ask ourselves those questions? And who are our stakeholders? Are they shareholders? Well, if you're at a private company, yes. For our organization, no. Our stakeholders are the patients who will, in the future, benefit from the drugs and vaccines that we develop. And, Chris, it's the same for the, the end users of the products that Camtech has, has partnered with organizations to develop, I imagine. So how do we think about our, how do we frame our own, um, our own understanding of accountability and our mechanisms to hold ourselves to that? Uh, and that's, a, that's, I think, an increasingly important question that would be worth asking frequently with regard to the COVID pandemic. Um, and, you know, Jen, one of the questions that you asked us to think about in advance was what advice uh, we got along the way that's been important to us. And I would say that's a, that's a really important piece of advice that I had the uh, fortune of learning early on in my global health career in a place that, um, like Rwanda, that made accountability front and center to everything that that the country does um, how it thinks about rolling out different uh, national strategic plans and how it how the government involves community health workers in major decisions that it makes um, and it's it's just a really powerful tool that we can we can all use more Thank you, Dr. Wagner. I'll move on to another question here. How do the panelists think the COVID pandemic will change funding from donor nations and organizations? How do you think the global health dialogue has and will shift? 
as HIV transformed global health and inspired programs like Partners in Health, Community Health Workers, et cetera, to tackle this unique crisis, do you foresee similar changes occurring due to COVID? Perhaps we should use this pandemic as an opportunity to explore the notion of quote unquote global health system strengthening, not just for future pandemics, but for essential inclusive healthcare for all. I would love to hear the panelists' thoughts on this. Well, um, well, Jen, let me just throw in a, um, a character, a, a rare one or two liner, rare from me. Um, you know, uh, to Kiran, who, who asked this, uh, uh, to Kieran, um, we, you know, it will happen if we make it happen. Or, I mean, if it is made to happen by other humans. Um, and I just point out that if there was... Uh, you know, some movement on HIV, it's because of AIDS activists, grassroots AIDS activists, you know, and Michelle mentioned this already. Um, and, uh, and people like uh, Dr. Agnes Benaguahu in Rwanda have made good use and worked closely with AIDS activists. So the, the example here is engagement in activism. And Jan, I know you have plenty of examples uh, yourself. So, um, we always meant by health system strengthening, we always meant global health system strengthening. Boston's on the globe too. You know, and back to the question of um, centralized versus decentralized, you know, it may look one way from Rwanda, but in the United States, you know, we, one of the reasons we have, uh, one of the reasons we have so much difficulty is we have an entirely fractured healthcare delivery system. And it's the same for public health, which in which we've underinvested terribly. There, like I said, there are, just there are thousands of uh, public health uh, districts and, you know, and it's just very difficult to organize. So I would say that's exactly what we uh, need to do um, and that it's gonna require a lot more activism and that holds for people in academic medicine as well. Otherwise, you know, as Louise said, you know, we're gonna have good reason for any, uh, for, for some pessimism. I think one, um, one reason to be hopeful to building on that is, um, uh, I'm not talking to the broad funding mechanisms, but um, there have been some really, really exciting public-private partnerships lately. Uh, and, you know, the pandemic has thrown into stark relief our need for the private sector to collaborate with the public sector. Um, so, for example, just this past week, just five days ago, Eli Lilly announced a major, um, major new collaboration with uh, the COVID Therapeutics Accelerator, which involves the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and that, that is to put millions of dollars towards developing monoclonal antibodies that can be a bridge to a vaccine and guaranteeing supply to low-income countries. So, um, you know, beyond these large global funding mechanisms, there's also other innovative ways that uh, organizations, both public and private, are working together to, to solve some of these problems. And I think that's one, that's one area that makes me feel hopeful, um, that there's, there's even more collaboration and the status quo is being disrupted more and more as we sense that we need each other more and more. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. Um, I, I'm reminded of uh, something I read recently about um, COVAX. So the, the 150 countries that have signed to develop and then distribute 2 billion vaccines um, by the end of 2021. Um, and again, this, this idea that we'll pool the money together and then there'll be this equitable distribution. Uh, I, I don't know if you're or others have thoughts on, is that moving in a direction? Is that, does that truly hold hope and promise um, for us. And again, not that we should, again, I, I would argue that vaccine could be somewhat of a distractor too when we've got so many other entrenched problems um, and that we could get trapped or, or misguided by thinking that's the sole answer to all of this. But just curious from the, the, the collaborative or at least face value collaborative nature of that, is that something that we can pin some hope on?
I mean, I think it says a lot that the U.S. is not a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, right. right. Um, I mean, I do. That should not surprise us, but yeah. <laughs> um, I do think that that represents, um, yeah, you know, just the the I don't know, re re really stepping back of from global solidarity and global collaboration, um, and I think it really. Um, you know, speaks poorly to uh, to the U.S.'s ability or willingness to be a global, uh, be a country that stands for global solidarity and global collaboration. Um, I also think at the same time that, um, you know, the U.S. not participating in COVAX, um, you know, again, just really um, projects very poorly uh, on, on us and a lot of the, the colleagues and friends that I have uh, you know, around the world are, are just confused uh, about what's happening in our, in our country right now. Um, and uh, send me condolences all the time. Um, and I, I think that that uh, is really important to sit with um, and, and, um, and process. Um, and I don't think that it means that every, you know, prior administration got it right. Um, I don't think that that's what we're trying to say. I think many of us are, are still um, very uh, critical of U.S. imperialism and what it has meant for um, global economies and global solidarity. But um, I do think that that, um, you know, the lack of U.S. involvement in COVAX represents something that we, we all need to think a lot more deeply about uh, and, and do something about. No, just, I noticed Chris was showing his uh, Rock the Vote poster, but I, you know, it's, it, I mean, maybe interesting, it's always interesting to me because I'm an immigrant to the United States from Europe, from Ireland, but I was always really struck by American exceptionalism, <laughs> exceptionalism from the moment I arrived, because I always thought I came from a pretty good country and I didn't, you know, I didn't really realize I was moving to the best country in the world. But I think when you, when you look at the fiasco and the large failure of public health in the United States for COVID with some bright um, positive examples to the contrary, like contact tracing in Massachusetts. You know, I think you see where American exceptionalism combined with white supremacy structures, combined with a drive for the private sector to be pushing most innovations and an underinvestment in public sector innovations and the translation of those innovations into actual delivery. You see this kind of, um, again, I, I'm searching for optimism, but I think it's a problem. If you look in the testing space in, in diagnostics for COVID, you, what you don't have is all you know, private corporations trying to use the same swab, trying to use the same platform and just iterating on that so they can make some profit around you know, some margin. But you see, you know, a different swab that's proprietary for every test. You know, you have to use the same buffer. You have, there's not really a, even in the U.S., um, a solidarity around finding a solution for the public sector to um, to drive forward. Now, maybe that's you know related to incentives and other things that I'm not totally au fait with. But I, I think to Dr. Morse's point and to Dr. Farmer's point. Um, and actually to everyone's point, like I think, you know, we have to be activists that use the knowledge we have and the insights we have in various sectors to keep pushing. And I think um, Dr. Morris is calling for us to be more radical and to push forward even more. And maybe that's the opportunity of the COVID pandemic and the movement for Black Lives is to, I think, in, empower us to be even more radical in our activism. And what I have observed is that in past pandemics, where academic people have written opinion pieces or perspectives or been in the news, it's been dismissed as not scholarly and not impactful. And believe you me, I know this for a fact because I just was doing my CV not too long ago. It's not considered impactful. But now we can see in our own lives how important you know, communication and public engagement is and how important that activism is. And so perhaps that's an, another opportunity for what I, where I think the re-envisioning has to be in our own structures, in our academic structures, in what we value and who we value, and what kind of knowledge and experience we actually value and attach the credits that we give and academics to. So perhaps that, that's, you know, that's the opportunity for us there as well. Thank you, Dr. Ivers. Um, 
I have another question from uh, one of the participants here. What an amazing panel, thank you. I had a question regarding the mention of cost effectiveness and sustainability in global health. Although I'm hesitant to approach thinking of health problems in low and middle income countries of the United States from the launching point of limited resources, um, which we could talk about, right? Uh, how do you see the role of cost effectiveness when health problems are newly developed in the US context, questions of investment into the next biologic therapy versus universal primary care, or in potentially a low and middle income country context, investment in a new MRI machine versus expansion of community health workers um, in those same countries. How do you see the consideration of cost effectiveness as we invest in people's health and work towards achieving health equity and justice? Well, I'm not shy about commenting on that. If I could, I, I felt for sure, Jen, you were gonna call on me uh, being uh, <laughs> sick of my commentary. <laughs> Parsa, that that was a, a great um, a great question. I, I just want to start uh, by saying one of our critiques of cost effectiveness is not, and in fact, my main cr critique is is not ideological. It's that it is so lame, right? If you if you have a concept or a tool called cost effectiveness, two nouns separated by a dash then you better get your assessment of cost correct mm -hmm. and you better get your assessment of ev effectiveness correct. So if you say, look, you know, our, uh, our treatment for COVID is rubbing spinach on someone's head three times a day, uh, it, that could be really cheap, but it's completely ineffective as far as we know. Um, and, uh, and so, and, and you know, that's a kind of a cheap shot, but the idea that you could replace, for example, a, a, example antiretroviral therapy with uh, you know trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, period, is uh, you know is, is just the kind of thing that we saw with clinical nihilism across Africa for years and years, and it's the same with leukemia care, and it's going to you know, and if if someone requires mechanical ventilation, which a lot of people do, I mean, I lost my father-in-law to COVID. Uh, then you better hope that someone is not going to argue that a mechanical ventilator is not cost effective a priori, right? Um, because something like a mechanical ventilator can cost whatever you want it to cost. You know, somebody can make them cheaply. And the same is true, of course, for vaccines and other novel therapeutics. Um, that said, I certainly hope that the um, pharma sector and biotech focus on these new tools. Uh, again, Claire mentioned in introducing Gates MRI that you know there there are serious market failures that have to be addressed by alternative mechanisms. But you know when you talk about an MRI MRI machine, I would love an MRI machine in Rwanda, and they're actually angling you know to get one. I, I would love to see one in Haiti that was not entirely at the you know fee for service, which they all are. They're not. There's the the first. Uh, cross-sectional uh, diagnostic in a public hospital in Haiti was in Mirbalé, where um, Michelle and uh, Louise and many others were working. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that's the most cost-effective thing in the, in, in the world, you know, the, because it's available, not based on fee-for-service, but on need. And we need a lot more investment like that. And that's what the Rwandan government has done, by the way, in putting 20% of their public budget into healthcare delivery and, and private. That's the highest probably on the continent and way more than, than uh, we put into public health uh, or uh, public sector care delivery either. So I think we have to rethink our entire uh, utilization of cost effectiveness. It's just a tool and the first thing we need to do is understand cost, not price, and effectiveness, not cheap. Mm -hmm. Not that I feel strongly about that. <laughs> Thank you for those subtle comments, Paul. Um, and I think, I, I know we're, we're kind of winding down and I, I deeply appreciate everyone's uh, participation and extraordinarily potent and thoughtful comments. I want, to, I want to end on this note because each and every one of us has had an opportunity to allude to this to a bit, but we have a bunch of students in the audience. And so 
you know, as if you were to think back and you got to try to keep this brief, right? With some of your considerations in pursuing a career in global health, what advice did you receive? We've heard from Dr. Wagner. What advice did you receive that maybe impacted the trajectory of your career? But, but maybe even most specifically, what advice do you have for medical students, for practitioners? Let's be a little bit more broad in our definition. Um, what advice do you have for other trainees who are really interested in, in a career in global health? And um, again, to be brief, concise, some take home message right now. And um, since I've been starting at the beginning of the alphabet, how about I start at the, the end of the alphabet and work my way backwards if you don't mind. So that means Dr. Wagner, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot for the first uh, um, parting comments, please. No problem. Um, great question. I will be very brief. Uh, I've learned a lot of lessons from many of the panelists, all of the panelists here over time. Um, but I'll, I'll just pick out one piece that I think is really important in our current context. And it's actually a lesson partly learned in Rwanda and reinforced in the HBS negotiations class. And that is to, when you can, work side by side against the problem. Even when you think that you're on the opposite side of the negotiating table, think about working together against the problem. And I think that's a really important, something I try and remind myself of a lot in doing various negotiations is we all are working for some same end, and we have differences in our interests and in how we want to achieve that end, but we need to work together. And, you know, in Rwanda, the Dr. Agnes would always say, everybody should come to the global health table. We need engineers, we need sanitation workers, we need doctors, we need, you know, everybody to be right there, construction workers. And so think about that as you go forward. That's something that I think about every day. So. And thank you all. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Olson, please. Yeah, um, one thing I'll agree, agree with uh, what Dr. Wagner just said is that that um, that really working across disciplines and taking that um, you know not only are you working side by side, but really trying to expand your purview beyond the people that are necessarily around your your table. And the other piece of advice that, that um, I got that I, I continually reassess is, is a deathbed assessment. Um, when you're on your deathbed and looking back at what you wish you would have done, if you're interested in working in global health, um, then do it. And, and, and try to look back at your life with a rectospectoscope and and uh, try to envision what you would be disappointed from having not done, what you would be proud of, of having contributed um, uh, to the planet during the brief period all of us have here. And, um, and I think it can be really guiding. That, that advice was given to me during medical school and it was uh, really helpful. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Dr. Morse, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll be super brief, agree with everything that's been said already. Um, and I would just say, um, approach everything you do with the deepest humility you can muster um, and really commit to your own political education first and foremost and recognize how, um, how much um, our medical education, particularly as physicians, really sets us off on the wrong path. and and. Uh, unfortunately results in us misunderstanding the, what actually creates inequity and what creates oppression. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Dr. And come I to our conference this weekend. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> send, us a, send us a brief uh, comment. Now, yes, oh, there it is. Wonderful. It's in the chat. Um, Dr. Ivers, please. Yeah, first of all, always listen to what Dr. Michelle Morris has to say. That's one of my lessons that I've learned a very long time ago, 10 years ago in a hospital in Haiti. But um, I think that, you know, my advice to students is that it, don't become paralyzed by the concerns about many of the structural issues we're talking about, about the how. I think for me, what I often say is that if you want to be engaged in global health, just remember that how matters. To me, the how matters actually way more 
then what do you end up doing? So if you're looking for a mentorship, if you're seeking a project, if you're starting your engagement, it's really worth time finding people who are doing the work in the how, that, in the way that you want to, be, to do it. And at the same time, don't, so don't be paralyzed by being so concerned that you're gonna do it wrong because you can find people in our ecosystem and you know, all the folks here are collectively somehow connected together. You can find people who are doing things in a way that you that match your values, that meet your wishes. And so please do that. Don't step back because we actually need more than ever um, young people and students to continue this movement and actually to take it forward and to be more radical and to take us to next steps. So sign up, <laughs> but the how, the how matters. Thank you, Dr. Ivers and, and, and uh, Dr. Farmer, please. Well, you know, I, I, I'm in so violently in agreement with my, my friends <laughs> here um, that, you know, really have only my gratitude to, to Haiti and not just Haiti, but the Haitians that I lived with uh, before coming to medical school because that corrective, um, I mean, that's what taught me about white privilege uh, was Haiti. Um, that's what taught me, taught me about the importance of understanding context, which is what's around you, but also how it was, you know, looking back over time. I, uh, it was, it was the, those Haitians that gave me that great gift. Unfortunately, I still work with many of them, those that are still alive. This was in 1983. So, um, and I know you have a similarly deep involvement with friends in, in El Salvador, and I know they've taught you many things. So I get back to, you know, uh, Michelle's point and Louise's uh, and that, you know, whenever we hear calls for cultural competence, we should just say that's not something we're ever going to have, but we could have cultural humility. And, you know, if you are a medical student, uh, you know, at Harvard or any other institution and you don't go into uh, a place in global health with cultural humility, that's when you have troubles. And I agree 100% with Louise. Don't get paralyzed, you know? There are many ways to do this. The how is the most important, not, not the what, you know? And you've heard from the people presenting today, uh, very, very different ways of engaging, very, very different kinds of engagement, rather, uh, in global health, but all of us share with you too, Jen, um, this real passion for the how, how can we do this the right way? So I'm, uh, you know, I'm just very grateful to have been included in this. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, thank, thank you all so very, very much. Um, and, uh, and you're absolutely right, Paul, that um, I was, I mean, my, my baptism by fire in global health really came in the form of being taught by the local campesinos in rural El Salvador, and that just really set my true north. Um, and so I think a couple of words that I would leave you all with is first and foremost, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are moms and dads and caregivers and you know, juggling, I have no idea how many different balls in the air. And so thank you so much for taking the time to participate. And thank, thank all of the participants as well for sitting and listening and reflecting. Um, and I would just hope that we continue to you know, recognize these fractured lines and, and faults and yet also really appreciate this collective like desire and energy to, um, to, to sort of do the best for everybody, that everybody's lives have inherent worth and value. And if we, you know, to, the, to our dying day, um, fight like hell for the living um, with those colleagues who are with us, um, please let us do that. Let us use our white privilege here. Let us use our US privilege here, um, working in academic centers to really elevate the creativity and intelligence of every single individual who is equally invested in exactly the same thing um, so that we create this, this net of interdependence and, and work towards equity. So thank you all again very much. Have a lovely, lovely evening and be well. And stay tuned for the uh, other five. Uh, we will definitely be bringing in a lot of global health voices for our next iteration um, and going forward. So again, be well and be safe all. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. And rock the vote. Just rock yeah. it. Yeah, please. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks so much.